What's up guys? I'm Eric from Mule Beast Designs and today I wanted to do something different, have a little bit of fun and take you through my new 3D printer, the Kitty Tech Q1 Pro. So I am not by any means an expert on 3D printers and I would definitely not take exclusively my advice on whether you should go buy this product or not. I'm merely giving you my opinion as somebody that owns a lot of machines and a lot of very industrial machines. And what my experience is setting up and using this printer for about two weeks now. So the Q1 Pro is a core XY printer. Now, to be totally honest, I can't define what that means to you. It, I, I'm 90% sure it has to do with how the gantry system works and how the machine moves. But again, I am not the best person <laughs> to consult on stuff like that. What I can speak about is the print quality, the setup, how I received the package, how the printer looks and what it feels like to use. I look at 3D printers more as appliances than I do machines. So when I'm buying a machine, for the most part, I understand that there's gonna be a maintenance schedule that I have to follow, um, a very much a buyer beware situation when it comes to industrial machinery. I understand that you have to do your research and that not every machine is gonna be good at the same thing and not every machine is meant to do the same thing and that there's specialties and certain machines are good for some things and then other machines are good for other things. I don't look at 3D printers like that. I look at 3D printers as appliances, more as appliances that I want to do a certain thing. I want them to 3D print anything I can throw at it to within a certain you know, reasonable sort of margin. And the Kitty Tech does do that pretty well. I've been able to throw a number of different programs at it and by and large, it, it does a pretty good job. It prints much faster than my Prusa MK3S Plus. And while I don't have a lot of other direct comparisons to it, I can't say that I have any complaints. It's a really big step up in terms of performance from that one Prusa device to this. Now, when I ordered the Kitty Q1 Pro, I'm almost forgetting the name. When I ordered it, it took about two weeks-ish to get here. I paid, I think, $440 for it, $450. I did, I, there was like a pre-sale and then I applied some other coupon that gave me an additional percent off. Anyway, it, it got here in about two weeks and to be honest, the packaging was really good. I package a lot of products and if you guys are familiar with, if you've ever received a product from me or you know what my products are or the designs and things that I make, it takes a lot of effort and I spend a lot of time making sure that the products are packaged correctly and they're in a box in a way that's gonna handle some mistreatment by our beloved package carriers. I think that Chidi did a really good job packaging this product. Um, the box wasn't in the best shape when I got it, but overall when I unpacked it, it looked pretty good. Uh, it had um, some pretty dense uh, white packaging foam. I'm not sure exactly what that type of foam is, to be totally honest. I should know. Um, but it had this really dense white foam around it. It had plastic corners. It had, I believe it was in plastic wrapped around it. There's not much else that I think that Chidi could have done to package the product better. Uh, maybe... I mean, in order to kind of the next step from packaging from that would be that ex same exact thing, but inside another box with more sort of like supportive corners to it, which to be honest, is just really, really unnecessary unless you're sending something that's insanely valuable or really, really fragile. The setup procedure for the GDQ1 Pro was pretty simple. I watched a number of, well, at the time, I think I watched every <laughs> YouTube video that was on this. Um, and basically everyone kind of had the same experience from what I saw. The setup was pretty quick and easy. 
the one confusing part that I found and that I don't remember whose video I saw on it, but the, if you follow the setup instructions as per on the machine, now the machine does have this like nice little touch screen right over here. And again, if you want specifics on that, I'll link some videos in the description that I found really useful. I, the instructions that are listed on the touch screen, it would be, make sense that you kind of do them in order, but in reality, you actually kind of want to do them out of order. You want to do the plate calibration first, then you want to do the auto bed leveling, and then you want to do the input shaping. Each one of those took about 10, five, five to 15 minutes. I think the input shaping took the longest. Uh, I've never done input shaping before. It doesn't really require any user input. It's just the machine shakes and makes like some weird noises. Um, I was not expecting the weird noises. So that was a little weird, but it was fine. It, it, it did what it needed to do and it's shaped now, I suppose. The plate calibration was probably the most difficult and one that I'm actually still kind of working on to get right. The plate calibration consists of three nuts that are underneath this platform here. And what a lot of the other reviews didn't quite understand or, or, or talk about was that there's three nuts situated underneath this platform. And underneath those three nuts, there's three lock nuts. Now, the lock nuts normally are kind of like in a reverse thread to what the other nut is. I don't actually remember if that's the case of this one. It doesn't matter. Some of the reviews cite turning the actual lock nuts as the application of, of leveling the table, as in those are the nuts that you're supposed to turn. That's not the case at all. And it does kind of work. You can kind of turn those nuts and get a result, but that's only because you're backing another nut on top of another nut and chaos ensues. Don't do that. Uh, just unscrew the lock nuts a little bit, make the adjustment to the bigger nut that you can actually turn with your fingers, and then tighten the lock nut back up while holding the bigger nut that you're supposed to actually turn. If that's confusing, I'm sorry. <laughs> I will <laughs> maybe, <laughs> if someone asks me, I can show you guys a little bit more detail what I mean about that. But it's not something that's explained in the, in the manual. It's something that I actually, makes a lot more sense when you look at the Q Max Plus or something like that. One of their other products has the same kind of uh, bed level calibration procedure. Once I kind of saw that one document on there, then I was like, oh, okay, that makes me way more sense. Because I was doing the plate calibration by turning the lock nuts. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, why would I, how would I turning a nut below another nut do anything? <laughs> anyway. Besides the plate calibration, which requires also like a paper test, that's really the only user input that's really needed for the whole set up procedure. After that, you're kind of done and you can go printing. Despite me not having a perfect bed level calibration thing, the printer stove works pretty well. I've been able to print a number of things and I've only had a failed print once or twice. And that was mostly because of user input. <laughs> um, the, by far, I think the coolest and my favorite feature for this has to do more with Clipper than Kitty. Clipper is the software that is effectively, or the firmware that's effectively running the CNC. It basically, it's like if you're familiar with like lasers or press breaks, like it'd be talking about like the, uh, like Fanuc or Siemens. So it's, it's the control software. And what's really cool about Clipper is that you can remote into it. Super, super cool. I don't understand why I have every multiple machines worth over a quarter million dollars and I can't do that on them. But this 3D printer that's $440, I can remote into, send programs, have a webcam. I can do all these things on this, but not, God forbid you can't do that on this other soft, on this other machines. 
I digress, but it's really, really cool. And I think that's a really great fixture, uh, feature. I know any piece of software or any machine or 3D printer that's running Clipper would be able to do that. But regardless, I think it's really cool and it's probably worth mentioning because I couldn't do that on my Prusa. Now there's a lot of features on this printer and I'm not gonna go over all of them. I've not used a lot of them, but I can kind of list them out for you if you guys are interested. There's uh, a nozzle cleaner, which is super, super cool. I have two high powered industrial lasers. One has, one has a nozzle cleaner, the other one doesn't. Which one do you think I like more? <laughs> it's the one with the nozzle cleaner. It saves a lot of time and it's just one less variable that you don't have to worry. This printer also has a heated basically bed chamber. It's effectively an oven. It has a little DC heater, which had so much controversy over it, which to be honest, like I don't quite get. There's, there's, there are certainly dangers to having a DC heater. If you for, for some reason, you know, you could potentially get electrically shocked if you jam a screwdriver into it. But the same thing can be true is true with like an outlet. Like who's gonna go jam a screwdriver and outlet? Again, I think that there's like, it, in terms of the conversation between machine and appliance, in terms of appliance, that is a, a lot more of a legitimate point and I kind of like respect that. So I mention it. But the machine has a heater. Uh, the nozzle is a, I they think they call it like a bimetal volcano nozzle. I don't really remember. It gets really, really hot. <laughs> is what I got. And hot enough that you can print engineering materials, which was one of the things I was really interested in. Along with the, along with the uh, chamber bed heating, the nozzle and the um, uh, surface plate that is also heated and gets to a higher temperature than normal, you can print some really nice engineering materials like ABS, um, nylon, all that cool stuff. Very excited to sort of try that. I haven't, I've been just printing with PLA plus for now. But that was definitely a selling point for me on this printer. I want to experiment with some more of those materials because again, I'm in a fabrication environment. Engineering, using engineering materials does have some application specifically for things like drill fixtures, welding fixtures, locations, go no go gauges. Those are all really practical applications for 3D printing and being able to print them out of harder, more rugged material that isn't just gonna like break or get cracked or when it's get thrown on the floor or run over by a forklift <laughs> would be really good. So yeah, that's it. This is my first impression to the KDQ1 Pro. I like it. I think that it was a really good value. I don't know if there's a better value for the features on this machine. I think that you can make an argument that there is probably better values if you remove some of those features, better values if you add some more other features to it. But overall, I'm pretty happy with this device. I'm anxious to use it more. And again, I'm not just looking for a machine, but I'm looking for something more as an appliance, something that I don't necessarily have to fiddle with and, and worry about calibrating all so much, although I have done certainly done that. If I had to recommend this product to anyone, I would say that if you're interested in doing some of the engineering materials, this is a pretty safe bet. This is a pretty good entry level device, I think, for that. There's, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this device to somebody that is unfamiliar with machines or unfamiliar with 3D printers or perhaps maybe not comfortable or interested in, in fiddling around and doing diving kind of maybe one level deeper like from the appliance level to one, one layer down to more, some of the more machine level things. It is a Chinese machine. I think the documentation for a Chinese machine is pretty good. Uh, the Kitty Tech forum or the Kitty Tech uh, subreddit seems like a really good resource for a, lot of, for a lot of information on it, but it's still a Chinese machine. It's, you're getting, you, you have to be aware of that when you, when you, when you buy something like this. But if you're okay doing those things and, and you want to, you don't mind sort of digging through Reddit posts or Googling problems or why doesn't something work a certain way or why does the Kitty 
uh, the GD software do this. That's what you do. I hope that you guys found this out at least a little bit useful. This is the first time I'm ever sort of giving a first impressions on a product like this, or any product for that matter. I think it's something I want to do more of. Let me know down in the comments if I missed something, if I, you want to hear my opinion on something else, maybe have more comparisons against like industrial machinery versus this like prosumer sort of machinery. Let me know. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.